Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Philips Dutch Design Week. This is our virtual design talk on human centered AI for cancer care. My name is Dee Siever. I'm a senior experience lead and service designer based in the United States. So coming to you a little early this morning, but I've been working at Philips for about six and a half years, and uh, this is my first Dutch Design Week, so I'm pretty excited to, to do this. I'm going to be moderating today's talk along with Yash Chatter, and we're both really interested in this intersection of AI and design, so we're pretty excited to be here. Yash, I'm going to hand it over to you for further introductions. Thank you so much, Dee. I am Yash, and I have been with Philips just over 3.5 years now, and uh, I have a background in, in user research, um, UX design and, and trends uh, research with uh, innovation. Um, D and I here are currently with Jan and, and um, Luke. They are the leading uh, design team behind uh, the human centered AI for cancer care work. Um, and we will spend some time getting to know Jan and Luke more about the project as well as dive into some interesting questions that D and I have for them along with a few questions from the audience. So let's give it a kickstart and I would hand it over to Jan and Luke to first introduce themselves and about the project. So Jan and Luke, please go ahead. Go ahead, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Josh. <clears throat> so um, my name is uh, Jan Pluiter. Um, I have a background in uh, information science, information technology, um, looking at business and, and, and technology perspective. Um, and uh, after that, I did my PhD in the area of human factors. So how do people basically process information and uh, specifically in the context of surgery? So how do surgeons deal with uh, complex technologies and, uh, and, uh, and teamwork? And um, how can you make the right decisions under pressure? Um, so after that, I joined Philips uh, now for about uh, 10 years ago. Um, so I'm part of Philips Design uh, as a usability designer, um, where I've worked on many different projects in the beginning and over time converged more and more to the oncology space. So uh, solutions to uh, improve cancer care. That's a program that we run together with Philips Research. Um, but as you will hear here, we also now expand more and, and partner up with uh, with Katrien Hospital uh, and the University of Eindhoven. Um, so um, I'm uh, I'm leading that program uh, uh, from the design uh, side. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Luc Geurts. Uh, currently, I have my role is a senior strategic strategic uh, designer. Um, originally, I have a background in electrical engineering and computer science, and somehow I ended up at design, <laughs> and that's uh, no coincidence. Um, what I discovered very early in my career is that I really love to work on, uh, on, on user interface technologies and understand where it's going to with all these new great technologies and how to integrate it into, um, into use cases and what is the real user benefit. So I started off doing research at Philip Research on user system interaction. Um, and did a lot of interesting prototyping there and user testing. And, uh, and, and with one of my innovations uh, uh, that moved to the business where I joined um, uh, a group uh, of software engineering while uh, yeah, doing product development in software. And after that, I was thinking, where, 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 where's the nice place to go? Where can you use prototyping really powerfully? And uh, then I ended up at design, um, where we had all kind of nice new ideas. And, uh, and I discovered the power of prototyping uh, in, in also connecting it to design thinking, connecting it to, to early stage ideas and, uh, and, and designs. And uh, what I like, and that's my passion, is uh, to connect the dots uh, from uh, from top to bottom, we often talk about the end to end experience. I like to to work more in the in the touch point, thinking about the the bits and atoms at the bottom. <laughs> this that's why my electrical engineering part comes the software, then going all the way up to the user experience, the user needs, and seeing how we can uh, make uh, uh, steps there, and uh, integrate everything. And then finally, and that gives the most rewards to test it and uh, see if it works. So. That's a bit about me, and I hand over now to uh, to the project to Jon. Again, yes. So um, 
Yeah, I, I can uh, first uh, tell you a bit more, a bit more about uh, the project of uh, of advancing cancer care with human-centered AI. Um, so as you can see here, and that's something we find really important, is that we're sitting here, but we're not the uh, only uh, uh, people in this team. It's actually quite a big team. So we started uh, about two years ago um, with a coffee chat, actually, uh, uh, with the, with one of the doctors and one of the scientists from the university to understand, like, what are the, the topics that we have in common and uh, where we're all interested to do uh, research uh, from an applied perspective, from a fundamental perspective from the university and from a clinical point of view uh, from the hospital. And uh, we ended up at the intersection of using artificial intelligence to support clinical decision making. Um, and we tackle different use cases and what you see here today is the pancreatic cancer uh, use case. So here um, we're, we're diving into that challenge a bit more in detail and actually it's um, it's quite a, a complex challenge. So you can see here already two sides of the story. Uh, the, the left hand side is more the, the clinical problem and the right hand side is, is, the, is the UX problem that, that kind of uh, naturally comes from it. So if, if we focus first uh, a bit on the left hand side and uh, pancreatic cancer is, is one of the deadliest cancers uh, that we know uh, worldwide. And the five year survival rate is very low. As you can see here, it's 10%. So 90% of patients don't survive uh, five years after uh, after uh, treatment. And um, the, the only possible cure at the moment is, is to do surgery. So to remove the, the tumor. And um, if we would like to improve uh, survival, then there are a few clinical needs uh, that that we need to address. So first thing is that you can only operate if the tumor is uh, is local, so if it doesn't spread throughout the body, uh, through the lymph nodes or to other uh, organs or uh, body parts. So you really need support in early cancer detection, detect it early so that you can uh, still cure it. Um, then the second point is that uh, if you find it early, the clinicians need support in understanding which uh, patients can undergo surgery and which not, so uh, improving resectability uh, assessment. And then also we need to enable the surgeons to make the best possible preparation going into the surgery because it's a very complex one, um, so we can help them with that. So here you see three clinical needs. And um, if you look at the other side of the of the coin, let's say, then we see that artificial intelligence in healthcare is is is, uh, is growing rapidly. It's uh, there's a lot of research in this area, many algorithms being developed in lab settings for all sorts of diseases. Uh, but at the same time, we also see um, that there's very limited adoption at the moment into clinical practice. So there's a lot being developed, but it's not actually used, and it doesn't reach the patient as much as it could. Um, so we dove, uh, yeah, we 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 dove into that topic, and one of the root causes of that is uh, a lack of human-centered design. So um, that means that uh, if you turn it around, that's what we want to address here. We really want to make the AI integrate into the clinical workflow and focus on the topic of adoption. So we have a couple of pillars in our project um, that will help to kind of. Uh, create a, a human AI team, or in our case, uh, a, a clinician AI team, the surgeon and the radiologist, where we want to develop algorithms that really uh, matter to them, that really help in their decision-making process, but also that in the way that they are shaped fit well into their clinical workflow. They're really busy. Uh, it's time pressured. They need to make very important decisions that are about life and death. Um, so uh, we need to account for that uh, from the start and uh, and also help them to understand uh, if they can actually trust the algorithm uh, at every instance, because the algorithms um, are, of course, not always right. So how do we make that? How do we open that black box uh, is one of the questions we have as well. Yeah, so if you... Um, it's good to know a bit more about the clinical background before we go into uh, talking about the solution. So what you can see here is a bit of the anatomy uh, in the abdomen, so the, uh, the lower part of the, the belly, let's say. So what you see is the, the pancreas, uh, the, uh, which is the organ that uh, uh, can contain uh, cancer, cancer cells. So you see here uh, a tumor inside of the pancreas. And um, uh, so 
if you relate it back to the problems I described earlier, then first of all, it's difficult to detect this cancer um, because the symptoms are coming really late. So people don't really have a lot of complaints until the tumor is quite advanced. Um, and also the tumor is difficult to spot. So it, uh, if you look at the CT image, it's, it's quite difficult to uh, find this, this tumor, especially uh, because it's, uh, um, not every doctor is, 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 is encountering this kind of cancer a lot. So it's not part of their routine always. And uh, these are aspects that are uh, really important. Then uh, what you can also see is that in, uh, in the back, so behind the cancer, you see the blue and red uh, blood vessels, uh, the veins and the arteries. And this, the, 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 the question about is this patient operable or not? So the resectability question really depends on this. So how closely is the tumor related to these blood vessels? And you can see more kind of schematic overview of that on the right. So um, if you take the top scenario, then the, the yellow tumor doesn't touch the blood vessel. And that's, that's good because then you can operate. If you take the, the other extreme, so the lower one, uh, the tumor completely grew around the vessel. So that makes it very complex because you also need to remove the, the vessels and kind of reconstruct. So it becomes more and more difficult to, to do this. And there, uh, and then I think the middle part is the, is the really interesting part is where um, there's a lot of gray area. So it can also be borderline. So there's a bit of contact, uh, but is it, uh, uh, still possible to operate. And this is the, the kind of questions that these uh, clinicians need to answer and, and answer together also. So it's uh, it's really a kind of clinical team effort to make such a decision where the radiologist is involved and the gastroenterologist is involved and the surgeon is involved. So this is where we want to support in making these kind of assessments. So detecting the cancer earlier, uh, doing a proper assessment of the vascular contact and understanding how this anatomy is shaped for every specific patient, because every patient is different. Pancreatic cancer is one of the deadliest cancers we know. It's often detected late. It requires expertise for both diagnosis and treatment. And surgical treatment is technically demanding. We need a technical solution that aids us both in diagnosis and treatment of pancreatic cancer. If we can detect the cancer at an earlier stage and characterize the tumor better, we can have a better curative treatment. We address these challenges in a consortium with academic and clinical partners, in a multidisciplinary team with clinicians, AI developers and designers. We co-created an AI-enabled solution that helps radiologists and surgeons get an instant anatomical understanding of the tumor and its involvement with surrounding blood vessels, which can make the tumor irresectable. Our first experiments showed that AI-generated anatomical models embodied in holographic displays provide better depth perception than a 2D display and better workflow fit and user experience compared to 3D printing and virtual reality. Our final solution adds three layers of information to CT images, which is the current standard for resectability assessment. First, AI detects and segments the tumor and its surrounding blood vessels and organs. It translates these segmentations into a 3D model and quantifies the amount of tumor vessel contact in line with resectability criteria that are well accepted by expert surgeons. Smart clinical viewpoints enable fast and integrated navigation across medical images and 3D anatomy, allowing the surgeon to calibrate their trust in the 3D model with CT data. We focused our concept on surgical planning, but we think it can also be used across the patient's care path. In discussion, in a consultation, in collaboration between disciplines, in tumor board discussions, and in surgery and surgery execution. The 
holographic display provides real depth perception and reduces the mental effort required to understand 3D anatomy from 2D imaging information. We validated our solution with eight Dutch expert medical centers using realistic simulation of AI to inform UX and AI development with surgeons' hands-on experience with the solution. This solution and its design fit perfectly into clinical practice. It enables the surgeon and the radiologist to get a better spatial understanding of the tumor with its surrounding structures. In this way, we can better assess and characterize the tumor and offer curative treatment for patients in the future. Wow, what a video, really fascinating work. So in this Dutch Design Week, we are really focused on how designers can navigate um, complex healthcare uh, pathways while also adopting innovative technologies, uh, empowering healthcare providers to deliver seamless care. Now, I have a, my, my first question to you both would be, um, we have been hearing about AI since the 1960s. Um, now in, in the current models, there are models like DALI2, uh, OpenAI and, and some AI models that can actually replicate the communication style of Steve Jobs even, right? So with your project and the broader perspective, how do you both see AI and um, its advancements into uh, aiding clinicians? John and Liu, please. That's a good question and also a good observation. It's, it's already a technology from the 60s, but uh, what you see is a lot of, uh, specifically the last decade, a lot of breakthroughs in AI um, research have been uh, been going through and also new application domains, what you already said, that, uh, and it's really being picked up uh, now more and more also uh, in different industries. Uh, and what you see now, what we what we're working with, we're working very intensely with the uh, university here and Philip Research on the latest AI um, uh, algorithms, and they're using convolutional neural networks that are able to uh, do biomedical segmentations. Uh, so if you train them with a lot of lot of data, which is annotated by the Katerina Hospital in our case, we have I think 400 uh, patient cases, then it becomes really uh, uh, well trained uh, for that specific task of of uh, outlining the tumor, or uh, that, but also early detection of the tumor. And um, what we uh, see now is that when you integrate it in the workflow, and that's also where the challenge is, uh, uh, the radiologist and the surgeon, they have like decades of experience of, uh, of interpreting uh, uh, medical images and, and finding the, the outlines of the tumor and, and, and the impact. And AI is not that, that far yet that we can be uh, very well 100% uh, um, with the tumor uh, uh, recognition. And uh, there will be a, a gray zone, which already also uh, Jan pointed out. It's, it's very hard for the AI to see that in those, uh, those DICOM images. So uh, that's one part. And the other part is how can we make it in a way that it is seamlessly in the workflow that we have kind of a team between AI and the clinical experts and that's also where we see the challenge how to integrate that and the way that we do things is that uh, very early on in the process uh, we understood what AI could do and what the limits and boundaries are and we simulated AI in our early designs uh, in prototypes, and that's that's how we uh, got a lot of feedback by actually letting them work with uh, AI in a simulated, <laughs> like a Wizard of Oz kind of way, uh, and that evoked a lot more um, uh, feedback from them. And also, we understood more about where are they exactly looking at, what information is important. Uh, we even discovered new data that. Uh, points that they're looking at that, that we fed back to the AI team that they could use to train the models even better. So early iterations uh, doing it, um, not to, with real AI, um, but, but simulated really works really well. And now we're integrating it with, uh, with the latest models, AI models in the next uh, half year. Um, another experiment what we did is also AI creates 3D models, but how can we integrate 3D models in the workflow? So uh, you see here four different um, uh, ways of, of presenting 3D. And our um, surgeon was really happy and, and um, he was thinking other oh, 3D printed physical object. That's the way to go. I can show it to my team. I can have interactions with it. Uh, I can uh, show it to the radiologist. I can point to things. It's, it's a real size. Um, 
that so that was his, his kind of standpoint. We had the idea that virtual reality could be very interesting, that uh, that having full interaction, immersiveness is really advanced and you can do a lot of things. But actually we put our radiologists and surgeon in VR and they they were yeah, it's it's a lot of new technology how to interact with the, with the controllers and it's uh, they are not used to it. It's also not integrated in the workflow uh, so well. Um, and then the last thing that we uh, uh, showed them it, is this holographic uh, display where we also had the idea of, hey, that could be something uh, that's very nice. And then actually the surgeon was like, no, forget the rest. This is what I like to have. This is how I can uh, immediately see intuitively the 3D depth. And, and the advantage is that I can, um, can interact with it. I can switch off things, make things transparent, and we can integrate it in, uh, in our radiology uh, uh, workstation. So it has a lot of benefits and um, I'm happy that we did this kind of uh, experiment and, and to learn uh, from uh, from their expertise and and also based uh, w work in a way that, with, that we use hypothesis. I think that's a very key thing that I've learned is uh, have a different hypothesis and then try to validate them with quick and uh, experiments early in the process. Yeah. And Yash, maybe also uh to add another angle to your your question so you 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 basically also ask like what is the difference between ai in the 60s and ai right mm. now right so i think uh, one, one uh, important thing to highlight especially in the context of healthcare is that um, uh, the, the early day ai was much more trained like uh, in a very transparent way so it's more like expert models where you can also follow the reasoning of the, the algorithm and output with conclusion what, what Luke explained is more like self-learning, right? So you feed the algorithm with cases yeah. and you tell what the answer should be. And then the algorithm figures out in between how input relates to output. So how you feed it the CT scan and you say that this is a cancer and this is not. And it figures out by itself, uh, basically how, how it comes to that conclusion. So um, this is also something that I think in a clinical context is really important. To, uh, to consider is like, okay, if we introduce these more like black box models, um, uh, it's still about uh, life and death, right? And the algorithm will not always be right. So these are additional things that kind of make it unique um, and make it also different from other technologies. Like uh, if you take a, a hammer uh, and <laughs> you, you <laughs> use it to smash the nail, it will work. Um, yeah. But it, the algorithm in one case or another might not work because it has maybe never seen that that particular case or something like it, uh, or it might learn different things. Uh, there are these famous examples where um, an algorithm was trained to distinguish uh, uh, and the, the kind of regular uh, bears from from uh, ice bears, and then. In the end, what what it learned it was was the background. So it it, it learned to recognize snow, and hmm. that's how it kind of made this distinction. And it was actually a perfectly functioning algorithm if you looked at performance, but the the reasoning was completely off. So these are things that are new in the current state of of, of AI, and um, are really important to address in a in a clinical context. I actually want to pick up on that a little bit uh, because Jan, you've really talked about the algorithm and how the algorithm is learning. You know, we This talk is titled Human Centered AI. So I think really my, my big question from you is like, what is the human centered aspect that we've really contributed, that you really contributed as experience design when thinking about how these models are being developed and learning you know i think i really want to hear a little bit about that human aspect and how that was brought in to the process yes. yeah yeah it's a good question and um uh, something we're kind of asking ourselves uh, continuously throughout the project um so i think that you can look at it from a few different uh, points of view so what luke mentioned already is that in our first experiments we included uh, different uh, ideas of how the AI could support the human being because I think if you look at it from a distance, what we should aim for is a sort of a, co a complementary uh, power, right? So, the the, the 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 clinical experts are really good at looking at the patient context and the whole the bigger picture, and the AI can also do uh, things well, but a bit more like narrow tasks. So we're looking for that. What is what makes them complementary? So we had 
initially a few different ideas about what the AI should do. Um, one idea was that it could uh, give the clinicians a sort of a prediction of resectability like you have with the weather forecast, right? Is it going to rain? Um, does this patient have pancreatic cancer and is it resectable? You can do something similar like that. Um, so that was one concept. We had another concept which is much more like what you just saw. So it was not giving that recommendation to a clinician. It was actually um, focused on segmenting these different structures, which by itself is quite useful because it helps to kind of translate the radiologist's perspective to the surgeon. You really make the, the contours of the tumor vi uh, visible and shareable and discussable between the different disciplines. So that was a completely different approach. And um, in, in that experimentation, um, it became very apparent that they didn't really need that first ID. So we, uh, but, uh, but they actually needed much more but what we just showed in, in the movie. So through that, we can kind of uh, change the scope and the goal and the role of the AI and therefore also the role of the human and the AI team because um, you kind of naturally uh, change both. If you if you kind of turn the knob uh, somewhere, it kind of changes the whole dynamic of how the mm -hmm. clinician and the AI work together. So that, that is about really the what the algorithm's role is and should be and what brings most benefit to the clinician and in the end then also yeah. the patient. And the other part is, of course, like how do you execute it, right? So Luke uh, uh, explained a few things about workflow integration. So if you embed 3D models in this busy context, how do you do it? Um, so Luke explained about, the, let's say, the, the form factor. So for example, virtual reality being more like closed off, which kind of blocks the whole idea of that collaboration is important, but that's something you need to discover. So in our experiments, these are the kind of needs that also surface uh, that uh, apparently uh, collaborative decision making is really important and therefore this holographic display might be a much better uh, option. And um, so that I think that's the, the middle level and then the, on the lowest level, um, we also think about uh, if you take the topic of trust, for example, then in the movie you saw that we always show the 3D model synchronized with the CT scans. And uh, in that way, we always provide the option for the clinician to kind of fact check if they trust the 3D model. Um, because the 3D model by itself looks super real, um, but they always have the, the real scan next to it. And we embed in the navigation, uh, a synchronized uh, navigation, such that the clinicians can always fact check if they agree with what they see in the 3D model. And I think that also makes it very human centered because um, you kind of empower the physicians to still be in control yeah. in an easy way. And I think that the sense of control, that's very important. Like also in our next iteration, we will show not only one outcome of the AI algorithm, but also uh, when there's more uncertainty that you allow for the AI algorithm. So in a way, you, you it becomes more a tool with multiple outputs and in an easy way, the radiologist could then say, hey, I trust this more than that. And uh, it, it gives inspiration or, or cues where to look for further and to adapt what the what we call the footprint of the tumor on the on the blood vessel. So it's it's about trust and also building trust over time and that have a sense of control how to uh, not not uh, controlling the algorithm directly but but what the output of the algorithm use it to to um, uh, to make a better better diagnosis and uh, and estimates. Yeah, I think here you can also uh, the everyday example of what what Luke mentioned is I think again a weather app, right? So yeah. <laughs> maybe yeah you cannot predict the future. Um, but uh, maybe the temperature will be around 25 degrees and whether that is 22 or 27, it doesn't really change anything to the clothes that you wear, for example. But still, you can be very transparent that we don't know exactly that it's 22 degrees. Okay. It can be a range and uh, that is how uh, uncertainty can also be used in a meaningful way. I'm just doing a, a check quick in a uh, check, a quick check in. There we go. Hmm. Uh, on audience Q&A. So far, we're actually looking a little quiet, so I really want to encourage the audience uh, to, to pipe in with some questions. Uh, I think just kind of one question that has really come up for me in this is like, I'm listening to you guys talk about 
all of the clinical aspects. And even in your intro, you know, you sounded so articulate on what is pancreatic cancer and what do those models look like? I'm a little bit curious, like how much of that clinical knowledge have you had to develop and, and how much of that are you, are you relying on others to, to really bring in? I find a very interesting question and, and along the way we learned a lot about the clinical field <laughs> and even uh, understanding a bit how you interpreted uh, uh, what they call the, the, the DICOM medical images. Um, what I really appreciate is that uh, through the collaboration with uh, with actually two radiologists and a surgeon, we, we, uh, we are taking along of how they are thinking, uh, how does the operation uh, happen, what aspects do they look for. Um, so we even uh, are invited to to join and to look uh, to be an observer at uh, when the operations happen. So we learn a lot uh, from that. Um, and I think it's really essential that, that you have kind of a, a, um, a deeper clinical knowledge. And I don't say that we have really reached that level uh, totally, but uh, but by uh, uh, being so um, um, closely working together, even having radiologists uh, joining our co-create sessions and giving feedback on the spot, um, that, then it, it rubs off this knowledge and uh, it helps to, to, to build a better, broader base. Just like we also talk a lot to AI scientists and they're trying to understand how these convolutional networks work and where they look at and, um, and with Philip's research, we also have clinical scientists uh, joining and giving feedback on things from the clinical side. Uh, it's, it's a highly uh, collaborative process and we're all building knowledge on different levels. So, uh, Yeah, and it goes for all disciplines. So I think yeah. what you see is that everybody uh, needs to learn something from the other two disciplines uh, to, to have a meaningful conversation because we're all trained in very kind of specific ways, right? Clinical, uh, uh, medical, uh, medical uh, school is, 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 takes a long time. So they learn a lot and uh, we're not able to, yeah. to do the same. Uh, so we have to rely on them, uh, but we need to know enough to be able to have a good conversation with them. And uh, I think that's where we can, uh, yeah, that, that's why it makes sense to join uh, in, in a hospital, but in a, in a similar way, um, um, I also took a few AI courses to understand like what, <laughs> what, what, yeah. what is the technology that we're dealing with here and what can you do with it, right? So what, what, what options do you have? If you take a uh, boot, then you know what you can do with it. But if you take AI, what is it that you can, uh, what are your choices? What is your design space? Um, and, uh, and what are the consequences? So uh, um, for example, if you look at uh, more explainable models or so models that are uh, kind of more open about how it reaches the conclusion, typically they also show a lower performance. It's not true for every case, of course, but these are the kind of trade-offs that you need to think about. And uh, I think it's very healthy that we think about that as a as a team, so from multiple disciplines, because the clinicians can speak to how important it is, uh, one versus the other, right? Performance versus explainability. From our perspective, we can uh, chip in uh, from a design point of view, uh, and the AI scientists in the end need to know the trade-off and train the models uh, accordingly. So that's really like joint decision making. Yeah. And maybe maybe another perspective at your question is also uh, we still need to be mindful that we are not the clinicians, even if we attend all these procedures yeah. and uh, we are not the end users, right? So uh, you saw it in this first experiment, we were both wrong. So the clinicians <laughs> thought 3D print, we thought VR, are, it ended up to be something else. Yeah. So we need to experiment and, and uh, put people in real action. I think that's something that's really yeah. important as well. So. In our studies, we try to be very realistic in terms of how we simulate AI. If the AI is not, not developed yet, we simulate it, uh, which allows us to kind of uh, yeah, define requirements for what the AI needs to be. Um, but we really need to uh, simulate also the context of use, so uh, giving them a realistic task. And this is something we did in, uh, in a couple of tests. Uh, the last one involved uh, eight different hospitals and 14 different clinicians. So there we actually simulate the surgical planning. So it's not that they would treat a real mm -hmm. patient. We cannot do that. Uh, that's, uh, that's something that comes later when you uh, validate things in clinical trials. But we can put them in a very realistic 
situation where we ask them like, what if this would be the patient that you would operate in one hour from now? What yeah. would your surgical plan be? Uh, so to kind of really put on the, the, the pressure like it is in, in, in daily life as much as possible and see if they can then work with it. Because if you just show it, they will say, I like it. But if they really need to use it to execute their work, uh, to perform their work, yeah. uh, can they do it? Can they do it fast enough? Uh, is it really clear enough? Um, so all of these things you can only uh, measure if, if, you, if you really set up a, a very realistic experiment. And that's something we're also planning to do more is to um, we are still conducting sort of a lab experiment. So over time we would like to move also more to uh, maybe putting the prototype for a longer period of time in a hospital um, still not involving patient care. Um, but the time aspect is, for example, really important for trust. Huh? So you can imagine that if the algorithm gives you one or two recommendations that were completely off, will you trust it for the next time? So this mm -hmm. overtime effect of trust from one recommendation to the other is something you cannot test in an hour. It's something that needs to be and we need to put put it out yeah. there for a longer period of time and see how people react so that that behavioral aspect is really uh, unpredictable and we need to study it uh, uh, in different ways. Perhaps something to add to that. Uh, uh, it's something that I also really enjoyed. We went with our prototype uh, uh, in the car to different hospitals all over the country with uh, and, and simulating this uh, surgical planning. And um, we we could observe how they were doing things. They were talking out loud. We, we could uh, uh, collect uh, the user needs from them. Uh, and also then we have a lot of hypotheses in our heads, but then, then you really start to understand how do they think, how do they um, uh, look at, at uh, medical images, what, what do they find important, and, and, and getting a deeper understanding of the user needs. And, um, and after that, we had, I think, hours and hours and hours of videos. <laughs> and as a team, we started to, to watch them uh, together and write down what are the user needs that we see and, and, and collecting what are the the the, the, the yeah, the, the golden nuggets where we can work on and where can we can improve things. Um, and that helped a lot uh, in, in, in pushing the needle and, and, and zooming into the real user needs that we can uh, address. Great. Very well explained, uh, Jan and Luke. Um, you mentioned trust and um, based on, on the complex architecture, um, getting more accurate results, findings, um, Trust in algorithms seems very critical in order for us um, to succeed in, in this space. Um, what has been your experiences when it comes to uh, clinicians and physicians believing in such an AI based technology that can actually deliver um, non biasness towards a certain case versus the other? That's a good question. Um, so I think maybe first thing what I would like to say is that uh, for me it's about uh, appropriate trust. So um, tr uh, gaining trust is not a goal in itself because it should be trustworthy. Uh, if you uh, uh, if you uh, if a doctor would trust it, it should also be trustworthy. So it's kind of a uh, a slope where the expectations of the clinician need to kind of match what the performance of the algorithm actually is, and um, that's a uh, there are different ways to um, kind of yeah calibrate that uh, that trust let's say or where we can help them to get some cues about can you trust the algorithm in this case or not um so i think in our in our tests you see um, uh, different responses from different people um so um some people um uh, used to uh, the uh, in, in in our second experiment for example we had a couple of different conditions so first they used the uh, the radiology images only for two cases and two cases also including the 3D model and then two cases also including the, the quantifications from the from the algorithm. So how much contact is there between tumor and blood vessel? And some people, uh, as soon as the 3D model is there, they kind of jump on the 3D model and they focus maybe 90% of their time on this and then do a bit of cross-checking uh, back at the CT scan. And some other people kind of stick to their regular way of working and they first want to make like their create their unbiased view of the case only based on the CT and then switch on the 3D model and the AI and do a sort of a cross check. So I think as a natural response and it's only like a small test, right? So we cannot draw big conclusions from it, but 
I think what struck me most is that you see a big variety in how people respond to this. And some people may trust it instantly and other, pe other people may be very skeptic. Um, so I think that's something we need to address as well as to trust this. It's not only about the technology, it's, it's about you, right? So um, that's something yeah. we need to account for. Uh. Yeah, and the experience over time, I think that's important. Huh? Mm -hmm. I think there's a Dutch saying, vertrouwen komt te voet en verdwijnt te paard. Trust comes by uh, by 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 uh, walking, and at least by horse. So if there's one case <laughs> and, it's, and AI is totally off, then then trust is broken. And, uh, I think it's it's important to, to come that it's becoming more uh, explainable or, or more transparent that AI could could have these kind of uh, glitches and that that uh, they are more forgiving when that happens. Also depending on what kind of AI it is. And also, meanwhile, AI will improve a lot, uh, of course. Yes. Yeah, I think also this is something that uh, um, is also a bit kind of uh, um, abstract uh, to a clinical user because they're not used to working with AI. So they also don't really know what they can yes. expect from it. And it might behave differently than other technologies. So, um, for example, we did another experiment in a different project. Uh, where we also looked at um, an, uh, nodule detection for lung cancer. So uh, is there a suspicious spot in the lungs, basically? And what we see there is also that, um, uh, if, for example, if you train an algorithm to be very good at detecting small nodules, it may be a big help to the clinician because that's typically something that's more difficult for a human. But if you train it more specifically towards that, it will kind of naturally uh, be less good at spotting bigger nodules, which is actually something that's really uh, easy or uh, relatively more easy for a human uh, expert. So uh, most support would then maybe come from detecting small nodules, but if that algorithm doesn't find the big ones and you don't kind of explain uh, why that is, then uh, the doctor might not trust the algorithm yeah. at all because it never found these big nodules. So how can it detect small ones <laughs> if it doesn't detect big ones? Right, so um, that that's in, an interesting space where we also, I think, tend to uh, kind of project our expectations uh, of, of human expertise on uh, on artificial intelligence, but it's not working the same way. Mm -hmm. So uh, that brings uh, new new questions that we need to uh, address. Well, I I actually want to pick up on that a little bit. I mean, so for you know the last, let's say 40 minutes, I think you have described at least a dozen adjustments that you made along the way. And uh, that continuous discovery is so important and critical. Um, so I actually wanna bring in one of the questions from the audience of then, how are you measuring success? Uh, you know, I think in this case, they were really asking, you know, success of the solution. I want to pair that then with also success of the project when you're doing so many adjustments and iterations. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about like, how are you looking at success and how are you measuring that? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I think success is measured in many different ways, of course. Huh? Um, one of this is that we simplified uh, the inter interaction, simplified the solution while still having the power of AI in it. Uh, I think that um, what I find one of the most successful things that uh, we have something that's understandable. It's not an AI algorithm somewhere featured uh, with a lot of parameters. It's it's something that's actually uh, easy to access and easy to use. So. Getting feedback from the field is, uh, and, and, and surgeons and radiologists who are really enthusiastic. I want to scale it up, even in the in different hospitals, and I can't wait to get our solution. That is for me a very successful thing. <laughs> and the other one is, of course, the recognition with four design awards uh, that we really uh, have something that is uh, unique and um, and and makes a different uh, step into uh, solutions for uh, using AI and in, in a human. Um, interactive way. I think that's for me a very um, important measure for success. And it's all qualitative in this moment. And 
and, and in the next phase we are going to get more uh, more insights also hopefully also uh, quantitative uh, moving more to uh, to more testing really in the field with longitudinal testing and then we can say that we're really successful or not or where we need to pivot even more yeah and and also um we basically wear two hats in this project. So one thing yeah. is developing this application, and 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 I think I did, yeah, ultimate success is that the patient is is better off if you mm -hmm. would use this solution than not. Um, the other uh, way to look at it is that we're also interested in, uh, uh, for example, uh, developing methods that we can use to test these kind of uh, human AI collaborative teams. Um, if you look at the uh, and what's usually done is that the AI is developed in isolation or um, uh, and, the, and the, the quality and the success level of AI in isolation is measured, right? So how often does it make the right prediction? Uh, but I think our whole uh, philosophy here is that we should also study the human AI team performance mm -hmm. and that if you take them together, they perform better than either of these two alone. But how you study that is a difficult uh, topic, which is also um, uh, not studied uh, a lot. So um, uh, extracting methods that we can also apply in other projects for that is also something that uh, we uh, really uh, uh, want to do here. Great. Great. So Jan and Luke, you both have worked uh, tremendously in different healthcare technologies, different uh, care domains. Um, I would like to uh, ask from both of you, um, what would be your um, biggest learnings uh, working in, in similar complex spaces, um, if you were to say it in, in one line each? One line is challenging. <laughs> 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 Let's look at it first. With the, it's a complex question that you're asking. But the complexity, um, it's, it's a lot about hypothesis. I think I used that word before. Um, and and uh, that also means that uh, you need to uh, understand um, the whole play field and with the hypothesis not not keep your ideas too long in, in drawings or powerpoints or whatever design uh, um, uh, ex um, uh, uh, ideas but make it into a, a, a kind of something that you can experience uh, simulate things um, go out and test your hypothesis and validate and uh, and then being also very uh, bold and looking at your the solutions and, and and being able to pivot and do that kind of in interact into interactive iterative way and um, that's i think the way to solve or to 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 look at complexity uh, that's for me one thing and the other thing is it's it's understand the whole field of all the different disciplines we don't need to be experts in and, and being this t-shaped person all the different disciplines but if we have enough knowledge that we can have this common language and um, and that we can connect and, and, and understand each other and also understand each other's challenges from the different fields. Yeah, I think uh, for me it would be uh, also uh, along that line. So I would say better together is is, yeah. uh, <laughs> is really important. So it's important in the human AI team, but it's re equally important in in our development process and that we, uh, yes, we are, uh, we have a designer title, but uh, yeah. we do this together together with the hospital, to be, together with the technical uh, experts. And um, you need not only to be together, but you need to work together and understand each other and learn to work together. So um, that that is really key here. Yeah. Nice. And I'm really happy when I see uh, surgeons and radiologists and AI scientists making drawings. And that happened a few times uh, in co-create sessions. And, and I think we're doing the right thing. Great. So um, D, you're a service designer. Right. Um, I would like to shift the focus from, you know, all the, the technical aspects of the project, but really understanding from you, how do you see AI um, in health advancing towards the next five, 10 years? Oh boy, so now, now I have to have perspectives on this. Um, well, you know, I think talking to, to Luke and Jan was really fascinating in listening how deep they were going. Uh, you know, like Luke talked about that vertical, you know, he really wants to connect that vertical. And so for me as a service designer thinking about AI, I'm sort of thinking the other way. So I'm starting to think about how are we adopting this in an organization? So, you know, that validation of the hypothesis of what's the right model, you know, was also talking about that workflow. So how do we change 
uh, that that shift from you know we're going to do CT scans to we're going to be looking at at the model. To me, that starts to be what's the education plan around this? How are we also supporting this? So as new developments in the AI happen, how are we deploying that into a customer or into healthcare? And so for me, what becomes really fascinating is that adoption journey where we know that that using it is really one point in time but we have to think about how we put that into use and then after that how do we make sure that um, it's continuing to be used or if that lack of trust happens or you know there is one of these moments where we're not um, you know seeing what we expected how do we actually come back and make those adjustments so for me as a service designer and looking at AI in healthcare, to me it's it's thinking about that workflow that you, Luke and Jan mentioned, but then even going bigger and thinking about how do we actually deploy in healthcare that we know is slow to change, tends to be very um, cautious in some of these things. We're talking life and death again. Um, and so really trying to think about, you know, that amazing vertical that Luke was talking about, but then bringing that into also the horizontal journey and workflow. And how do we make sure that that we're also delivering success in that? I'm actually we've got just a couple of technical questions, so so I want to see we've got a just enough time that I'm going to see if we can do some of these technical answers, Luke and Jan. Um, so one question was related to, are you also starting to introduce recommendations of treatment or possible risk success? And then the second thing that I want to see if you guys can answer is, um, how are we also looking at bringing in additional data sources or inversely opening this up to be kind of an open source. So if you could both answer the um, the the sort of additional recommendations, thinking about the risk, and then how we're looking at those data sources and potentially opening this up beyond Phillips. Can maybe take the first mm -hmm. one. So I think um, the short answer to the first one is uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's quick, <laughs> quick answer. Uh, but. Uh, I think in this first experiment, we experimented with this. Huh? So we 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 uh, we let the AI take different roles as a recommender system, saying, "Hey, yes, this patient is resectable, or 90% uh, <laughs> likely that it's resectable," versus some more kind of uh, yeah, more like a supportive system that kind of augments the decision making process of the of the clinician. And I think we really kind of yeah converge more and more to the second one. Because in the first one, we, we noticed that clinicians have, um, so as human beings, it's very difficult to interpret probabilities uh, to start with. So what does it mean? 90% likely that you can operate the patient. It's now for this patient that is now in front of me, does that patient fall into the 90% or the 10? So it's always about like individual decision making and, and then these probabilities are useful, but also quite uh, abstract. So these kind of yeah um, things led us to go more into kind of supporting the clinicians to kind of just um, uh, yeah augment their decision making, making maybe the degrees of contact more objective, making the anatomy better visible and shareable and discussable, and that kind of leading to uh, to a better uh, decision rather than letting the AI recommend the option. And so then on the second side, that that potential open source or how are you pulling in um, further uh, uh, further surgical data? Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, it, um, I think it's more a clinical question how to to do that with uh, different uh, surgical data. But one thing that I can say is that uh, we're also moving to a way that we have like an AI manager that you have different AI algorithms that you can can use or switch in the in the future in our solutions in general for Philips uh, 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 applications in this field. Um, and, and in that way, um, you can make more individual choices uh, as, a, as a surgeon or radiologist or hospital, depending on what is the 
uh, your 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 protocol or your workflow which which algorithm works best and how can we uh, integrate that in, the, in a good way and there will be different perhaps interfaces uh, or principles that help uh, and and uh, to navigate the output of AI and to uh, to use it in practice. Hope that answers uh, the question. And are we looking to open this up beyond Philips development? I think that that's something we I, I cannot. Uh, uh, <laughs> that's the, that's the question it. for our intellectual and property team, right? Yeah, I think so <laughs> too. And, uh, <laughs> and, and on intellectual property, I know it's, it's very hard to get patents on how AI works. It's it's a black box, but also when it's a black box, it's difficult to patent. Uh, so it's, um, I think we, we have a, a lot of steps to make, but also I see a lot of potential of, uh, of integrating uh, different uh, AI uh, algorithms. Fantastic. Well, on that, I just want to say Thank you so much. Uh, even in prepping for this, I had a fantastic time talking with you guys. I've already scribbled like another five questions that I'm going to be following up with you off offline. Um, so just really appreciate that. For our folks that are joining uh, for today, just also want to remind you that we do have one remaining virtual chat. So or a virtual virtual talk. So do sign up for that. Um, just incredible smart people and smart designers that are really looking at things. So still time to join another one. And then for those of you that are fortunate enough to be able to be in person in the Eindhoven area, I got to see some uh, as they were building pictures of the exhibition. So do also stop by the Phillips Museum. I just want to say as my first Dutch design week that I've been able to participate in this, this was really excellent. And so I hope everybody that joined us today also had a great experience. Thank you everybody and have a great rest of the week. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>